All right, guys, let's get started. No protection for you guys. Um, hope you had a good spring break. Today is uh, a full lecture on boosting. We're going to start with uh, Add a Boost, which we started talking about two weeks ago, but we'll review what we covered because it's been some time. And we're going to start by presenting Add a Boost as just an algorithm, which is kind of how Perceptron was presented, right? It was, it was an iterative method, and it, it was like a recipe for how to compute this prediction function. Um, so we'll start presenting Adaboost that way, and we're going to kind of get a feel for it, see how it's working, kind of make sure it at least intuitively makes sense to us. And then we're going to present kind of a new approach to modeling called forward stage-wise additive modeling. And what we'll find is that Adaboost is exactly an instance of this new framework. And the new framework is something more familiar to us, something that we can understand in terms of loss functions, in terms of minimization, iterative minimization algorithms. So that's going to be nice to reframe Adaboost in a more familiar setting. And then we're going to generalize a bit further to something called gradient boosting, which will allow us to move away from, uh, move to more general loss functions than the one that the Adaboost is minimizing. So lots going on today. So let's do a little bit of a review. We were talking about ensemble methods where we have multiple models that we combine together. We spoke about parallel ensembles, which are like the random forests and the bagging. But today we're talking about sequential ensembles. And the idea there is that you build a model, you see what data points it does well on and where it does poorly. And the ones that it does poorly on, you increase the importance of. And then you make a new model that tries to do well where the previous model did poorly. And then you look at the com combination of those two models, and then you see, well, where is this still doing poorly? And you try to repair. In each step, you try to repair the, what's still not doing well from the models you have so far. OK, we'll make that a little bit more clear. All right. So we started with this idea of a weak classifier, which is kind of a um, it's a classifier which we hope can do at least better than 50%, at least better than random guessing on a classification problem. All right. I have some examples. And so in Adaboost, the setting is strictly binary classification. Our, our weak hypothesis space, or our weak learner, produces hard classifications, negative one and one. So we're not in the setting of scores at this point, where our base classifiers are predicting hard classes. All right. So the question is, given this base hypothesis space, and we have an algorithm for choosing an f from this hypothesis space that does at least better than random on some training set, can we combine f's chosen from this hypothesis space in some way that can do very well on the training set, not just a little bit better than random? So an Adaboost, typical weak learners, typical base hypothesis space would be like decision trees or even decision stumps, which are trees of depth one. Um, sometimes linear decision functions. Traditionally, we do boosting with rather simple hypothesis spaces. This is not required, but this is where it seems to give the most uh, benefit. OK. So one thing that we'll need is this notion of a weighted training set. So this is where every item of the training set has a let's call it a non-negative real value associated with it. And we look to minimize a weighted empirical risk, a weighted, the sum of the weighted loss functions. We talked about this last time. So rather than just the average of the loss on the data points, we have a weighted average. And we're going to need a, so we're going to either A, need an algorithm that can choose a function from our hypothesis space that minimizes the weighted empirical risk. Or there's another possibility. Do you guys remember the other approach to use? Suppose we don't have an algorithm that knows how to minimize weighted empirical risk, but it's a black box algorithm, and we know it can minimize empirical risk. So what was, we talked about this last time. Do you guys remember what we can do? We'll try to figure it out again, because last time someone figured it out. 
OK, duplicate the training examples. In what proportions? Yeah, according to the weights. So the weights are non-negative. We have a weight for every training example. If we normalize the weights so they sum to 1, what does that turn into? This is like a probability distribution on the examples. OK. So if we draw our example, so we have a training set. And then now we have a probability distribution on the training set. Now imagine drawing a new training set according to this distribution. All right. So and suppose you made it very large, just so large that um, you know almost every data point appeared multiple times. So the number of times each data point appears is going to be proportional to this weight if you draw enough examples. All right. So if you just add up the examples drawn up, drawn up from that distribution, the normal empirical risk on that resample distribution will be very close to this weighted empirical risk. And you could feed those sampled examples into your black box empirical risk minimizer that doesn't know anything about weights. Is that clear? All right. I guess we're a little slow coming off spring break. But I saw some nods. That's a good start. That's a good start. OK. So we have, so now we, we have a way to fit a weighted empirical risk from a function in our base hypothesis space. And that's going to be something we will need to have. So here's the rough sketch of Adaboost. We have our training set. We start with equal weights on all the training points. And now we proceed in different rounds. So in each round, we use our algorithm and fit our a weak classifier, something from our hypothesis space, to the weighted training points. In the first round, they're weighted equally, so nothing special. Okay. So we get our weak classifier. And then we see what this GMX misclassified, and we increase the weight on the examples that were misclassified. And then we repeat. So what's going to happen is if a point is misclassified repeatedly, its weight keeps getting larger and larger. And every time we choose a new classifier, it's going to be working harder and harder to fit that one point or those points that have been misclassified before because their weights keep getting driven up higher. Yeah? Is it impossible that when the points of the misclassified samples start misclassifying the ones that are classified Yeah, so the question is, it's great. You're, you're doing all this work to correct the things that were wrong, but are you not messing up the, the things that you had before? This is, yeah, it's a balancing act. So the new, the new classifier that you add may only get a little bit right, the, the one it was working really hard to get. And it may do terribly on the other ones, it's true. But we actually combine it with all the ones we had before. So hopefully, the ones we had before are still strong enough on the rest of the data points that the new thing doesn't mess it up. So this is, the, this is kind of the balancing act that we'll see happening when we get into the details. OK, so kind of schematically, we start with the original training sample. We get the first classifier in the usual way. Then we have a reweighted sample based on what things were wrong. Those things that were wrong have a higher weight. We get a new, a new classifier based on that sample. Then we take the same sample and reweight it again, et cetera. And then we get M classifiers. Remember, these are classifiers that output negative 101. They're hard classifiers. And they've all been trained on different weightings of the same data set. All right. And then what do we do at the end? We take a linear combination of them. And the specific way we do that, we'll talk about shortly. And then what kind of value is this linear combination going to be? Is it going to be negative 1, 1? No. It's going to be a linear combination of negative 1s and 1s, which are not negative 1 and 1. It could be a real number, any real number so far. And then so we take the sign of it to convert it back to a classification. OK. That's the big picture. OK. So what are these weights? What are the weights? How do we combine the classifiers from each stage? So the weights are going to be non-negative. And as someone asked a few weeks ago, 
do we want to weigh the classifiers that did well higher than the ones that didn't do well? And yes, to some extent, yes. So the, we're going to see that the alpha m's are going to be um, larger when this classifier fits the weighted data well, the weighted data that it received, and smaller otherwise. OK. OK. All right. So let's talk about round M, an arbitrary round M. We get this classifier GM. And it gets a certain weighted error. So this is where we count the misclassification, this kind of the 0, 1 misclassification rate. But instead of just adding up or getting the percentage of errors, we're going to weight those errors by the weight of the individual example in that round. Right? So if we were really trying hard to get example I correct, the weight was really high. Why would it be high? Because we kept getting it wrong in the earlier rounds. So if we were really trying to get the ith example correct, and nevertheless we got it wrong, we're going to count that higher in our error. It's a weighted error. Good. So ERRM, error, we'll call it the error of the nth round, error sub m, that's going to characterize how well our nth classifier did on this weighted training set. All right. Um, and you should notice it's between 0 and 1. Is that clear? Why is this between 0 and 1? If you look at WI divided by, capital W is the sum of the WI. So WI over W, that's like a, prob it's, it's like a probability. If you add them up, it sums to 1. They're all non-negative. So this is like taking a, a convex combination of things that are 0 and 1. So that's certainly between 0 and 1. Yeah? Correct. We initialize all the Ws to be the same. That's right. Yes? How do I decide the? The order of the classifiers. One second. <laughs> right, let me come back to you. I'll come back. Yes? Say again. Outliers in the data, yeah. It could be an issue. So the question is, what about outliers in the data? Can we overfit? Yeah, AdaBoost is known to have some overfitting issues. We'll come back to that. Good question. Well, I don't want to call it overfitting so much as performance not being great in the case of outliers. Overfitting, I don't know. Well, maybe it's overfitting, yeah. I didn't even understand your question. How do we? <laughs> I, so let me just let me recap, and you stop me when there's an issue. Okay? We have our data set, fresh data set. We consider each data point to have equal weight. We fit a classifier. We see where it does well and where it does poorly. Where the where the errors are, the ones that have errors get their weight increased. The ones that don't have errors, their weights stay the same. Now we have a weighted training set. This is weighted training. This is tr uh, weight set number two. All right. OK. Now we're here, weight set number two. Now we fit to this to minimize the weighted loss, weighted empirical risk. And oh, you got it. OK, great. We just needed a recap. OK. And then, then we get uh, classifier number two, G2. All right. And then we repeat G3. And then at the end, we take a linear combination. Now, at this point, we're saying a non-negative combination of these classifiers. And that's going to be predicting real valued numbers, scores. And then we take the sign to get a classifier. Yeah? In 
the first round, you are correct. In the, in the very first round, there's a symmetry, right? Because every point has either been classified correctly once or incorrectly once, right? And so if we reweight depending on just on whether it was correct or not, then you're correct. Everything in the second round will have one of two weights, but not so in the third round. Because they're going to have things that were correctly classified once or twice. Or three. And it turns out it's not just how many times it was classified, but it's also related to how well the classifier did in that round. So anyway, yeah? How do you do it? OK. Well, that depends entirely on the question was, how do you minimize the rated 0, 1 error? All right. So I gave, so version 1. We reduce it to the case of minimizing regular 0, 1 error um, by this resampling of data proportional to the weights. I don't know if you were here for that part. OK. So one version is by resampling proportional to the weights, you reduce it to minimizing 0, 1 error. Now you could say, we don't know how to minimize 0, 1 error. And that is true. So really, you don't have to minimize it. You aim to minimize the 0, 1 error or the weighted classification error. But you really just need to do kind of better than random guessing. Adjust the weight classifier? Just a weak class, yes. Just a weak classifier, right. The exact amount that we'll re weigh it by, well, in every round, we'll see that everything that was incorrectly classified gets scaled up by the same factor, depending on the round. The weight, in fact, it gets multiplied by the same amount. Well, why don't we why don't we look at the next coming slides before we get into that? Yeah, yeah. Sure it does. It looks at every data point, unless it. Well, yes, it, it, you never get zero weight. So yes, it looks at every data point in every round. That's right. Yeah. It may almost ignore certain data points when the weights get very very small, which happens. Yes. That's a great question. I haven't heard of anyone doing that, but I, I like the idea. So maybe you could have a threshold. Like, if the weight gets really small, you just set it to zero, and, it, and you pray that it never stops classifying that correctly subsequently. It's, it's worth, sounds, sounds worth a try. I, I don't know. Um, OK. It's interesting. But it's the right idea, I think. OK. All right, so let's, you guys are hungry for the actual specifics, so let's just get there. Um, OK. All right, so this was us to answer your question. So we want to treat the weak learner as a black box. We can use any method we want, but we want to at least have kind of weighted error less than a half. OK, that's sufficient for what we're going for. All right, now, the weight of the classifier. How do we do the reweighting? Here it is. So we reweight by this factor alpha m. Here's a formula, log of 1 minus the error over the error. I don't know exactly. It doesn't mean anything to me directly, but I plotted it so we can just look at it. So on the x-axis, we have the error. This is the overall error, the overall weighted error of the classifier, right? the weighted error. And if we have no weighted error, alpha is very high. And as the weighted error gets closer to a half, alpha m goes towards 0. What's alpha m? Yeah, alpha m is the weight of the classifier when we, so remember at the end, we're going to add all these classifiers together. And the weight that that classifier enters the, the non-negative combination is alpha m. So alpha m big means it gets a lot of weight. Alpha m small means it gets very little weight. 
So if the classifier has really bad weighted error, then it's going to have very little weight in the final thing. OK? All right, that kind of makes sense. The shape, at least, is in the right direction. Um, so now that's the weighting of the entire classifier. And now the other thing we need to know is how we reweight the individual examples right? in each round. OK, so let's take a look. So, so let's suppose alpha m is, we calculate is the weight of gm. So it turns out we're going to use alpha m also to help us reweigh the individual examples. So suppose wi is the weight of example i before the training. And if gm classifies xi correctly, the weight is unchanged. Right? So in every round, any example that was correctly classified, we don't touch it. Otherwise, we adjust it. We increase it by a factor. All of the weights of all the uh, incorrectly classified examples are increased by e to the alpha m. That's our factor. All right, well, e to the alpha m, that counts as the log. But well, we can look at that, too. So this is, this is the adjustment to the weights for the incorrectly classified ones. All right. So the shape's the same. The only difference is that now it's on a log scale on the, the y-axis. So, so interpretation, or let's do a little bit of a recap. So every example that's misclassified in a particular round has its weight rescaled. Is it increased or decreased? Increased, good. And, it's, and everything is rescaled by the same amount. They, may, they still end up at different values because they started at different values. But the factor you increase them all by is the same. And the factor is, yes? I do. We start everything in round one with the same weight, say one for everything. Everything that's misclassified is rescaled the same amount. So if it's a doubling, all the ones that are wrong are rescaled by the same amount. Yes? Only ones that are wrong are rescaled in each round. That's right. So if we start it all at once, and there's a particular example that's always classified correctly in every round, it stays at 1. Yeah? So if we use a density error function, we don't take into account like, the logic, like how confident it was? When no, that's correct. There's no, so the, the question was, um, suppose we had a base classifier that didn't just output negative 1 and 1. This is entirely restricted to hard classifiers. So the, there is no score given by the functions in these hypothesis spaces. It's just a plus one or a minus one. You could ask, suppose our hypothesis space gave um, classifiers of confidence. Can we leverage that somehow, is the question. I think we can, but not out of boost. It's not out of boost. Yeah. Yeah? Will rescaling increase the error? I'm not sure it can be a little more uh, clear. So you're rescaling the weight on a data point. So the error of what? Our goal is to come up with a function that performs. At this point, our goal is to find a function that minimizes the overall training error. That's right. I'm using data rescaling as a, as a piece of the process to get to minimizing the training data. That's correct. So that the question, I think, is basically like, does this thing actually work? <laughs> Politely asked. We'll come back to that. OK. All right. OK. Um, you said that for a lower error, you have a higher weight, which it will be the other way around. Did I say there's a lower error for higher weight? OK. So if the, OK. So lo, lower error, higher weight, give me on what? Weights on what? So error is the weighted error for a particular classifier at round M, say? 
the re, uh, we re, we, yes, we, we weigh the classifiers by alpha m, and that's the amount that it gets multiplied by before it's added into the sum of classifiers. So there's a weighing of the individual classifiers. That's one piece of it. And then there's also a reweighing of the examples in each round. And what's interesting is the factor by which we reweigh the examples is related to the factor that we used to multiply the classifier by. We're using alpha m. Alpha m is involved in both cases. Yeah? OK. Can we use alpha m as a confidence score of the classifier? Alpha m is related to how well it does on the weighted error. So in, it's, a, it's, it's some measure of performance. It may be only vaguely related to how helpful it is to the final classifier. But. That's correct. That's true. It sounds like a why does this work question. <laughs> we'll come back to it. Let, let me get through some more slides, and then we'll come back to these questions. All right. So here's, here's kind of the overall algorithm, everything we talked about already. Um, so I don't think we need to dwell on this. Here's a little bit of an illustration. So we start with um, our input space is the, a box of sides one by one. And we have two classes, red and blue. And we have, so this is our first classifier. After one round, what do you think our base classifier, our set our base hypothesis space is? If this is, what, huh? Threshold function, yeah, OK, decision stumps. A, this looks like decision stump. A stump is a tree where you only have one split. So here we've split on the x-axis at whatever, point, negative point 0.1 or something. And to the left, we're predicting red. And to the right, we're predicting blue. The color being black and white represents how big our score is for each color. All right, let's do another round, and it'll be more clear. All right, so what's going on here? We have uh, now the, all the points are of different sizes. What do the sizes represent? They're the weights at this particular round. All right. So after three rounds, the weight of this red thing right in the middle of the blue zone is very large, because it keeps getting misclassified. So after three rounds, this point has a very large weight. All right. These points deep in, in red zone and correctly classified are quite small. They're like spots. So OK, we've been saying that the weights stay the same or get bigger. So this is rescaled so that um, they don't get too ginormous. So these are, these are the ones that are the smallest. So in our version, that would be like they would still be at weight 1. But here we've kind of rescaled to keep them proportional. OK, so this is the most confident red. The score is the maximum. And then this gray is a, a middle score. And then this white is score at the other extreme. And the final thresholding is given by this yellow line. OK, any questions on this picture? So let's look at one more round. Or after 120 rounds, you see this the decision boundary can get quite complicated. This is far more complicated than a single decision. All right, so this is one decision stump. By basically linear combination of those, we get this more complicated boundary. And here we get something that's quite complicated. Um, OK, and then you see the blue. Now the blue ones are very large, because they've been, now they, these blue guys are deep in red territory, and they keep getting misclassified. All right. All right, how's this picture settling with you guys? Good? Let's clarify some things. OK. Why is the upper left still large? Well, that's a great question. Um, so I guess it hasn't. <laughs> I guess it's had enough times that it wasn't correctly classified. Okay. That's a good question. Yeah? Yes. Yeah, so 
I think what you're I think what you're saying is correct is that let's see if we can mash it up exactly. I don't know if I've aligned the pictures well enough. <laughs> I wasn't expecting this close examination, but let's suppose that indeed see this little yellow thing that's changing the class there. So this is I don't know. Would you say this to me it looks like overfitting? All right. Okay. So we'll have other ways to work on overfitting issue, but. Um, do you guys have any ideas right now of how you might prevent overfitting with this type of algorithm? Limit, oh, limit your number of iterations, of steps, of rounds. Yeah, we could stop running Adaboost at a certain point. Maybe use validation error to say, all right, that's enough. We're getting worse. Okay. All right. All right, so now we come to the question that you guys had. But so, so, so far, just overall in the class, we've kind of seen the main type of thing we've done is set up things as convex optimization problems, like we had L1 regularization, L2 regularization, SVM, kernelized versions of these things. And you know, they're convex. You kind of do any reasonable optimization algorithm, and you're going to get to this, the right place in the end. And those were, those were quite nice. And then we had trees. In trees, we know what we wanted to do. We just didn't know algorithmically how to do it exactly. So we described this kind of heuristic process of building a tree out and then trimming it back, which people find work pretty well. You're choosing something from the hypothesis space of trees. There's no proof. In fact, we don't know how to actually find the best tree, the best hypothesis space. So, but anyway, we have an algorithm for optimizing the trees. Um, I was making a different point in that bullet, but that's OK. Um, so Adaboost is something new. It's just an algorithm, that's what I mentioned earlier. So it's kind of like the perceptron algorithm. Um, so we have to ask the question, like, will this minimize the training error? At this point, that's the goal. Eventually, we want it to do well on test error. But for starters, we need to have it be doing something reasonable on the training error. So there's a th Theorem, it's not too hard, but it's too long for lecture. I may put it in the homework as an optional problem. Um, it's not too hard with some guidance. So it is true under pretty minimal assumption. All right. So here's what we need. We need it to be an actual weak classifier. So we need it to have weighted error less than a half. So we define this term called the edge. The edge of a classifier is describing how much better than random it is. So it just takes a half minus the error. So now we want a big edge. Big edge is good. Big error is bad. Big edge is good. So this is measuring something like how much better than random GM is performing. So here's a theorem, which we'll, we'll kind of try to figure out what it means in a minute. The theorem is the empirical 0, 1 risk. This is the original error, not the weighted error. Right? This is the thing that we actually want to minimize in training. The empirical 0 and risk of Adaboost classifier GX. What is GX? It's, the, it's that non-negative combination of the individual classifier, the weighted classifiers at each round. Right? OK. So it's like alpha 1 G1 plus alpha 2 G2 up to however many rounds we ran. All right. So what's on the left here? This is that. This is the true, this is the, the risk on the training data, the average number of, the, the percentage of errors, basically. It's bounded by this product. So what is it? It's in terms of gamma m. Gamma m is the edge of the individual classifiers. Right? So would you think big, big edge should be better, right? Big edge is far from random. So if this thing is big, If this thing is big, this thing gets small. And we're multiplying a bunch of small things together, so it's small. So this, when gammas are big, this product is small. And that's good, because we want, that's the error. That's bounding the error on the left. OK, let's look at some examples. All right, suppose the, um, the weighted error is less than 0.4 for all rounds, just to see what it looks like. Then the edge is 0.1, because how much better than 0.5 we are. And then we get that the error rate is bounded by 0.98 to the m, bounded by 0.98 to the m. So 
great. So if m, the larger m is, the more rounds we run, that thing goes down exponentially fast. 0.98 is bad. If we only run for one round, that's not a good bound at all. But if we multiply 0.98 against itself many times, that thing goes to 0. So if we run for 100 rounds, the bound is 0.133. 200 rounds, 0.018. Okay. So the upper bound decreases exponentially quickly. Let's go. One question. Yeah. This happens for any other users of the classifier, or does it change something? Change. Okay. So I made one big assumption to make this picture, to make this, to make these numbers. What was my assumption that I made? I assume that the edge, the error is always less than or equal to 0.4. So um, if I could do that, this is the result. So you might ask, well, so your question was, does this work for all hypothesis spaces, right? OK. OK, no. Suppose we have a hypothesis space for which we're not able to get a, any edge at all. We can't do better than random guessing. Well, then we won't have this error bounded away from a half. And we won't be able to get this exponential decrease, perhaps. Um, so I mean, so another question would be, um, well, suppose, all right, test question. Suppose the edge is, or suppose the error is bounded by 0.4. Um, Will we always be able to get zero error on the training set? So yes, is the, is the proposal. And I agree. Um, the bound goes down to as long as the, if the edge is always, if the error is always bounded away from a half, then we're always going to have exponential decrease on the upper bound. And eventually, the error is going to go to zero. And it will be exactly 0, right? Because on the left-hand side, this will get arbitrarily close to 0. And the smallest non-zero thing the thing on the left could be is what? What's the smallest number the thing on the left can be that's bigger than 0? 1 over n, right? So the right-hand side will eventually be less than 1 over n, so that drives the left-hand side to 0. So if we can always guarantee the error is less than a half, strictly less than a half, then the training error will always go to 0. So this should tell you that if you have a training set with outliers, with points that aren't, you know, where the red and the blue are, um, are not separable by some kind of linear combination of your base hypothesis space. So if your hypothesis space can't do it, if, if you're taking linear combinations of things in your hypothesis space is not able to separate your data, then you can't possibly get zero training error, which means you can't possibly have the error always less than a half, the weighted error of a given round always less than a half. Right. Any questions on this? Yeah. Yeah, so out of, exactly. So the question is um, what we classify can we use? Yeah, Adaboost basically takes a black box classifier, preferably one that can handle weighted training data. But if not, you have to do your sampling trick to make use of it. But right, algorithmically, you can use any classifier you want. To get this type of theorem to work, you, yeah, question. So is the question is, is there any reason that people use these simple classifiers instead of something more sophisticated. Um, OK, I think the empirical example reason is that they tend to work well. Um, people have run experiments, plenty of people run experiments where you do fancier classifiers, like SVMs and stuff. And you can get some benefit from boosting SVMs, but not, not so exciting as, um, well, what type, so what types of classifiers do we have in our, in our tool chest that we, we might want to use? Right? We have these linear classifiers. So um, 
that's kind of not that ex not as exciting to take linear linear combinations of linear kind of prediction functions. Trees are are nice because they have these nice nonlinear properties. Yeah, so um, the point is that if there's a notion of generalization error, which is how well you're going to do on your test data compared to how you did on your training data. And the more complicated your base class is, you're, at, you're exposed to having bigger generalization errors, so bigger you know, overfitting, essentially. Um, so yes, that's a good point that as you increase the, cl your, the complexity of your hypothesis space, then you're potentially overfitting. But really, we, in any case, we're going to do early stopping or something. So we're not really going to overfit. right? It's just a different trade-off. It's just, um, yeah. Yes? The pictures? Sure. Sure. we decrease errors is because we have more so the question is uh, why are things okay so why are we doing better after three rounds than we did after one round is one of the questions yeah, okay why so one reason that we can do better after three rounds and after one round is because by taking these linear combinations of decision trees, of decision stumps, we get a more complicated uh, boundary that cannot be represented by a decision stump. So our effective hypothesis space after three rounds is bigger than after one round. So that's, it's just a more expressive set of hypotheses by the third round. Yeah. So the question is, is this this, will we get the same boundary if we run a decision tree with three splits? Um, no, no, not necessarily. It's, you may say, is it the same, uh, one question is, is it the same hypothesis space that you're selecting from? You could say, is every uh, decision boundary that we can get from three rounds of boosting on stumps the same as the set of all decision trees with, um, I guess, three splits or three nodes. Um, maybe, I'm not sure. But, well, but none of the minimization is exact, right? For trees, we have a method that's a, an approximate method to figure out the right tree. Attaboost is a, another way to end up with the hypothesis in that set. Even if the hypothesis spaces are the same, the way we choose them is not the same. So it's an interesting question whether the hypothesis spaces are the same. But in any case, out of boost and just choosing a decision tree directly of that size are two entirely different trees you're going to end up with. You're definitely not going to end up with the same tree. The question is, uh, is the hypothesis space, the, the hypothesis space that of after three rounds of boosting with decision stumps, the same as a certain type of decision tree that you can easily describe? Maybe. Cool. 
Okay. All right, so I'll show you a few quick questions. No? Okay. So there's this curious property of um, boosting, which is that people often, this was kind of a mystery in, I don't know, like 10 years ago or something. So as we run AdaBoost through many rounds, what you would expect to happen is that as the number of rounds increased, your training error would go down, 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 maybe reach zero in this case. The test error would reach a minimum and then go back up. So what people often realized, found though, in practice, is that it didn't actually look like that. What they found was that the training error may go down, but the test error kept going down, which is kind of interesting. Um, so they have some explanations of this. Um, they kind of go beyond the scope of this course, but the, uh, this is kind of the topic for like a fundamentals of machine learning class. I don't know if they cover this specific topic, but um, this is an interesting thing in the, in, the, in the lore of machine learning that boosting had, Adaboost had this unusual property. But one thing this tells you is that, and we're going to, I'll refer back to this, is that um, there's something special going on in the Adaboost algorithm. Remember, Adaboost is like a recipe. What's coming up next in the second part of this lecture is we're going to show that Adaboost is actually minimizing, in some sense, a particular loss function in a particular way. And what we know is that if you just minimize a loss function for hypothesis space, this is not typical behavior. So there's something special about how Adaboost is minimizing this loss function that gives us this interesting uh, behavior. All right, let's take a break then. See you in 10. Yep. You can use anything. So people usually use trees. Yeah, you have to decide. Not often. I know, just. It's not linear,
get started? Alright, this is where it gets exciting. Okay. Now we come to looking at boost out of boost from a different perspective. What is it doing in terms that we are more familiar with? Not just this reweighting and resampling and this fancy algorithm that supposedly works. Um, okay. So boosting fits an additive model. What's an additive model? So we end up with a classifier of this form. This is a, a non-negative combination of GM. GMs are our base classifiers, right? And each GM is a weak classifier. OK. So one way to think about this is that GM, they're like basis functions. Imagine GMs were fixed in advance. Then all we have to do is find what linear combination of GMs that we want to use. And if that were only that, that's a simple linear regression problem. But the GMs are also unknown. The GMs are kind of like basis functions that are learned from data. It's an interesting way to think about it. Uh, is that clear? We end up with a linear combination of these GMs. The GMs aren't really fixed and known in advance. They're figured, chosen from the data. OK. So this is called an adaptive basis function model in statistics. All right. So. What we're going to do is we're going to start with something like this. We're going to generalize it a bit. And then we're going to tie it back to out of boost. And then we're going to change it a bit. OK. All right. So we, before we have weak classifiers, we're going to generalize a bit and just call it a base, a base hypothesis space. We're no longer restricting the classifiers. The base hypothesis space could have regression functions. It could have classifiers that give scores like SVMs. So much broader. F is a set of prediction functions. It's our hypothesis space, base hypothesis space. Um, they would be the weak classifiers in the boosting setting. So an adaptive basis function expansion over the set F is this linear combination where HM are our basis functions, and they come from F. And VM are these things we call, we can call them expansion coefficients, because base is expansion. Um, and the key is that we want these HMs to be chosen adaptively from a hypothesis space. Adaptively means based on the training data. So it's a pretty flexible type of model. All right. uh, I just want you to note, um, so just because of this expression, what do we know we have to, what kind of restriction do we have to put on F? Or maybe we'll say put on the action space. OK, what if our f had functions in it that returned red or blue? OK. So how is that going to be a pr That's a valid action space. An action space is any set, right? Yeah, it should give a real number, because we're taking linear combinations of the what's produced by the functions. All right. So real value, I, I suppose it could return anything in a vector space. That's kind of the minimum thing you need to add two things. Um, and multiply. So if in a vector space, you have scalar multiplication and addition. That seems like what you need here. So we're only going to be talking about, yes? OK. I like it. So all right. <laughs> so I said you want something, you want a vector space so that you can add these things together. And then you're saying, so it's close. OK. Well, that's one way. But I, you're, I was saying that the output of the functions has to be a vector space. You're saying the functions themselves are in a vector space. 
Both may be true, but the way I'm presenting it, what we need is that the outputs of the functions be in a vector space. But here, they need to be reals, basically. Um, in some versions of like multi-class classification, you want your prediction functions to give scores for each class. So that's like a, you could view that as producing a vector. All right, but for now, we'll do reals. All right, so what are we doing? How do we fit? So we, we, take, we start with a loss function now, L, as usual, and a base set of hypothesis spaces. And we want to find this linear combination that minimizes empirical risk, say. That's our standard story. And the approach is we're going to proceed in stages, just similarly to Adaboost, where in each stage we pick a new HM from our base hypothesis space. So. You can, we start with, say, the zero function. This makes sense because we know our functions output reals. So we could say, all right, there must, let's suppose there's a function that has, predicts zero for everything. Okay. And let's say we're in the m minus, we just finished the m minus first stage, we're ready for the mth stage. And so far, we have this function f sub m minus one, which is a linear combination of m minus one basis functions. And what's up next is to, Choose a new function and add it in. You guys okay? Okay. All right. So I've used some different terminology here. So we've got m minus 1 terms here, and we need to find the next one. And now I'm going to call it a step direction, just suggestively, and a step size, new i greater than 0. And we want to choose it so that when we add the vi, whoops, that should be vm, hm. That should be vm. Sorry. When we add that to fm minus 1, we get a new function fm that's somehow a little bit better in terms of the empirical risk. So we want to be descending in this in sense of risk. OK. All right, so written out in kind of an algorithmic form, we, in, each, in each step, the key thing is finding vm, our step size, and hm, our kind of step direction, or the new function we're adding. Here's our average loss. Here's our loss with the L. Yi is the sum over the data points. And our prediction function, the new one, is the old one plus step size times step direction of the new one. Is this clear? So this piece in the, in the prediction part of the loss function is the prediction of F sub m. If the new thing we add is a particular H and a particular new step size. And we're trying to minimize the loss over all choices of this h and this new. It's worth staring at for a while. This is the kind of the key, the key piece in this approach. Is it clear? Can someone explain it? I could explain it again. Yes. function f, and we're going to add a new piece to it. And the new piece has two parts to it, the function part and the scale of the function part. And we're searching over all scales and all functions that minimizes the total loss on all the data points. OK. There, you had two explanations. Yeah? No rescaling. This is a, we started over. This is a new approach, and I will later tie it to Adaboost. Or I would just claim that it's the same. <laughs> Another homework problem. Yes? There are infinitely, there are potentially and often, for, typically, infinitely many HMs and VMs. That's correct. That's right. That doesn't scare us. We have infinite hypothesis spaces all the time. I'm still not scared. <laughs> yes? The hypothesis space for every function we try to find is fixed, is the claim. Question? And 
the new function h is always from the same hypothesis space correct. The hypothesis space we're choosing from is fixed at the beginning. That's two things determine this, the loss function and the hypothesis space, and both of which are chosen and fixed at the beginning. OK. Yeah? The what? The sum of the VMs is not 1. OK, one second. First of all, let's compare this to Adaboost. In relation to Adaboost, what, what variable in the Adaboost setting is, is, are these nu's most similar to? Alpha m. Right, OK, good. So the alpha m's did not sum to 1 either. The alpha m's were just weights. All right. All right, now I will tell you this interesting connection, which is uh, not terribly difficult to prove. I may make it a homework problem also. So if we choose our loss function to be this loss function, I don't believe we've talked about yet. It's called the exponential loss function. It's, is this a margin loss? It is a margin loss, because the loss function is a function of y times f of x the class times the prediction, which is the margin. That's the definition of the margin. This is a margin loss. Um, let's see if I don't, oh, I have a picture later on. Um, but it turns out with this loss function, and if our hypothesis space is the set of, is a set of weak classifiers, just like we had for Adaboost, our black box hypothesis space, then it turns out that this procedure, forward stage wise additive modeling, reduces exactly to add a boost uh, with a small caveat. Uh, you can see the hasty tip Shani Friedman book for a proof. It's good to work through. Um, the only difference is that um, this is this FSAM forward stage with additive modeling, it's very strict. It says give me the arg min. That says find me the H and the new that minimize this locks function. Do we ever say anything like that in add a boost? No, in Adaboost we said, please give us better than random. <laughs> Error m is less than a half. OK. OK, so that was what we wanted for our theorem in Adaboost. But if in Adaboost we are using a, weak, a, a base classifier that found you the best possible hypothesis in the hypothesis space, then it's exactly equivalent to forward stage-wise additive modeling. Um, OK. So this tells us that Adaboost minimizes, in a certain way that's peculiar to Adaboost, it minimizes the empirical risk for the exponential loss. So that's great, because now we can, look, we can interpret something about what Adaboost is doing by looking at the exponential loss, like we've done for other functions. OK. So here's a picture of all our classification margin losses that we've seen. I've rescaled a bit so they all go to the same point. So the new one is this purple guy. That's the exponential. All right. And this hinge loss is now kind of flat and looks pretty much like the logistic loss. So does anything concern you about the shape of the exponential loss? Yeah? No. OK. It penalizes heavily to the outliers. I agree. What's going on here? So let's remember what the margin thing is. What's going on to the right of the margin, right of 0 here? Correctly classified. Great. And to the left of 0 is incorrectly classified. What's the x-axis? It's the margin, which is like the score that we produce times the actual class. We want the margin to be big and positive. Big and negative is really bad, because that's your, it, the size of it. An absolute value is how confident you are, and being negative means you're wrong. So big and negative is bad. Um, OK, so yeah, we do want to penalize something that's bad. But there's the issue of, someone asked earlier, does it actually also penalize when it classifies correctly? Yeah, but not that much. It does go down to 0. So 
yes, only the hinge loss goes to exactly zero, but this is, this is OK. Um, it's not like square loss that started penalizing more for doing better. Um, so that's not so much the issue. The issue is with things like label noise. So a point that um, is basically should, should not be correct. It's like it's an outlier. It's in the wrong place of space. You don't want the function to correctly prick that because it would be overfitting to do that. So, but with an exponential loss, this function, this point that's deep in the wrong territory on the wrong side of the decision function, it's going to be penalized really heavily for not getting it correctly. So in Adaboost, unfortunately, it does work very hard to get all these things correct. Um, and what people find in practice is that in classification settings where there is some label noise uh, or it's not a clean separation, um, Adaboost doesn't do as well as some other classifiers with more forgiving loss functions, such as logistic or such as hinge. OK. So um, in a clean classifi classification, like you know, AI type problems, where there's not much noise. Like everyone knows, like that's a person, that's a horse. It's not a. There's no label noise. Um, you know, in that case, maybe it's not so bad to penalize heavily for errors. But um, but in cases where kind of the Bayes classification rate, the Bayes error rate, remember it's the best you can do with any measurable function, is is high, like say 25% or something. Exponential loss doesn't do so well. It's empirical. And this is why. Any questions? OK. All right. Uh, OK, I think it's enough from this deck. Up. All right. So in some sense, Adaboost with ex exponential loss with kind of classifiers as our, as our base hypothesis space, that's our, that's our example one of forward stage-wise additive models, right? That was FSAM was the general framework where you had to pick a loss function, you had to pick a hypothesis space. So I picked those, exponential and negative 1, 1 classifiers, and we get Adaboost. Fantastic. Example two. Pick the square loss, and I pick a hypothesis space of regression type functions, some hypothesis space that produces real values. So let's look at FSAM in that setting. All right, so I've plugged in our loss function. Remember this piece? This is the new version, the new, this is F sub M, where we have F M minus 1 and add the new piece. Now we have a square loss. and we want to minimize that in every step. OK. So let's rearrange a bit. Let's distribute that negative. And what we have is a piece yi minus f sub m minus 1 xi. So I'm calling that the residual. Why am I calling that the residual? All right. f sub m minus 1 is, is our classifier up to stage m minus 1. And then we can look at its error in terms of square loss. Or let's just look at its, its, its difference um, at every data point. And that's, call, that's called the residual. So yi minus fm minus 1 xi, that's the residual. All right. And now we're getting something that's pretty close to like a standard regression framework. Let's, let's fix, clean it up a little bit more. Let's make an assumption. Let's assume that our hypothesis space is closed under scalar multiplication. That was a concept that you mentioned earlier. So in other words, if h is a prediction function in f, then so are all the rescalings of f, of h, and the negations as well. OK? All right. Well, if that's the case, we can drop this, this new scaling factor, because all rescalings of h are going to be in f anyway. So we don't have to look for an extra, scale, an extra step size. We can just minimize over the functions in f. All right. All right. So now. This should look very familiar. What is this? What objective function does this look like? Uh, 
How can we make this look like square loss regression? Yeah, predict the residual. So instead of trying to, usually this would be yi minus h of, xi, h of xi, right? Instead, what if we tried to predict the residuals, ri? All right, great. So let's make a new pseudo training set, x1, r1 through xn, rn, where ri is this residual. All right, well now that is square loss regression. But it's not necessarily like any square loss regression we've seen so far. What's different here? Potentially. So the, point, the key point is that this is, this is the regression, yes, but it's not linear regression. Linear regression is where, is where we had h of xi. It was a linear combination of xi, and we knew how to solve that. It's not linear here, but it's still a regression problem. Um, what nonlinear regression algorithms do we have so far? OK, kernelized. Regression is nonlinear. Yes. What else? We don't have a lot, but what are they? Yes, trees. Exactly. Regression trees. Great. Do we have any others? Not a lot. We have we have bagged versions of these things. I guess we have added boost now. Anyway, that's not that's only regression if you don't take the sign. So this framework with this forward stage wise added modeling with L2, the square loss, and a real valued hypothesis space is called L2 boosting. Um, so what do we need to run this? So I give you a hypothesis space F, and I say go implement L2 boosting. What, what do you need to have? What black box do you need to have to be able to actually implement L2 boosting? I tell you the hypothesis space, F. How do you, what would you need to still need to actually implement L2 boosting? What would you need? Yeah, well, there's only one thing you do in L2 boosting in each round, right? You need to solve this minimization problem. You need to find the H that minimizes this square loss. You need a way to do that. That's what you need to implement L2 boosting. You need a way to solve this regression. So, okay. So if it's if the hypothesis space is trees, we can use a cart or some tree building algorithm to f to find it. Um, okay. So what we've done basically is reduce L two boosting. We can do it. We just need a way to do regression using the hypothesis space we're given. Square loss regression for the given hypothesis space. Yes. Well, what I mean by the step size being absorbed is that here we're minimizing over nu and h. I'll call it v and h. <laughs> All right, so if the f over h is an f. So if f has all possible rescalings of h, then any v you came up with to get vh, well, vh would be an f itself. So you could have found that directly. That's what I mean. Good question. All right. Yeah, please. We do regression trees have the property of being uh, able to represent all rescalings? Yes. I mean, the algorithm won't actually necessarily give it to you, but it can at least represent it. Um, but I see your point. Um, I think because I think because of the way we ch would choose it, it should be equivalent. But that's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah. Again? Is the decision stump a vector? It is not. 
we didn't require the functions to be in a vector space. We required their outputs, their predictions. So what does a decision stump uh, produce as its output, given an input xi? Well, so let's call it a regression stump. It would produce a, a number. A regression tree produces numbers for any given input. Right? It's the average of the training examples in the particular partition, in the particular, particular leaf node. So it can be any number. Yeah. Um, and on the hypothesis space, there is no it, is, it can represent any, any of those things, not conditional on the data. Once you know the data, it's restricted. But the hypothesis space is before you get to the data, and it could potentially represent any of those things. Yeah? Yeah? Um, what is, what is non here? Uh, this, this function, uh, OK, what is nonlinear here? So, the hypothesis space can consist and typically would consist of functions that are nonlinear functions of the input x. Okay. And if it will compress linear functions, it would make sense? If the base hypothesis space had linear functions, would it make sense? Yes. You mean, is it trivial, or what do you mean by does it make sense? No, it's Yeah, that's not very interesting. If you have linear functions and you take linear combinations of linear functions, you still have a linear function. This is not very exciting. That's true. Right. Which is one reason we wouldn't do the add boost on that either. Sorry, one second. Adaboost is different. OK, there's two different things. So there's a difference between a, a threshold, how to put it? So the things produced by um, Adaboost, the weak classifiers in Adaboost have to produce negative 1 or 1. So while the threshold may be a linear function, the function itself is not a linear function of the input. Because it's producing, it's a step function. It's not remotely linear. So at a boost, even if we have these kind of linear decision boundaries as weak classifiers, those are not linear functions of the input. OK, that's an important point. Here, though, here, though, we may, if we're out, we could have actual linear functions, not thresholded. And then linear combinations of linear functions are very boring. But if we had thresholded linear functions, like we might use for add a boost, then that could still be interesting because linear combinations of, you know, thresholded linear functions are highly nonlinear and and powerful. Yeah, great. Glad we sorted that out. Okay. All right. So I've given two examples. Could I give a bunch more? Maybe not. Um, so what have we done so far? What's, what's hard about this setup? The hard part is solving this minimization problem. So, so far, we've found one case where we can do it exactly, I claimed, in the sense where it reduces to add a boost. So in add a boost, we actually, we'd, add a boost doesn't give a way to get it exactly. This is actually kind of an error. Um, but at least it has, it's in the right direction. Um, so one was, to, was add a boost, and the other was we reduced it to regression. So we said, if we can solve this regression problem, then we can solve this FSAM problem. But in general, you know, every time we came up with a new loss function, we had to sit down and think of a way to optimize it. Like trees, that was a, an odd one to choose the right hypothesis. You know, we went, if we had, like, you know, an L1 loss function, we'd have to think about, you know, how do we optimize that? Maybe we have to do it iteratively. We don't have a closed form solution, for instance. So every time you come up with a new loss function, doing this type of minimization, it's, you have to invent a new approach, potentially. So kind of want a way around that. So we're going to come to that in some slides, hopefully. Otherwise, tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah, well, 
Um, this is an error. So what I was saying is that this reduces exactly to add a boost under the assumption that your weak classifier is a perfect weak class is a isn't really just a weak classifier, but it's the it's a classification algorithm that gives you the best weak classifier in the hypothesis space, which is not necessarily easy to do. So, so I should say reduce it to add a boost. So, but finding the minimizer is not necessarily easy for an arbitrary hypothesis space and arbitrary loss. So, we'd like to find another approach. So, but before we move on, I want to remind you, I want to take a new perspective on this FSAM. I want to relate it to coordinate descent. So, let's recall coordinate descent for a second. Um, in coordinate descent, remember, we have, you know, maybe a feature space of D dimensions, and we picked a particular dimension and we found if we just adjust that one parameter uh, out of the d parameters, what's the optimal value for that one parameter? Remember that? So we go all the way to the minimum in one direction, and then we go all the way to the minimum in the next direction, and then again. OK. So that's coordinate descent. And I claim there's a kind of a connection between what we're doing here and coordinate descent. So let me show that. Suppose our hypothesis space is finite. Our base space is finite. So I'm writing it like h bar 1 through h bar n, capital N. So the final classifier is this linear combination of these n things. We can represent that by the coefficients in the usual way. We could parameterize this function we end up with by capital N coefficients of each of those basis functions. All right. So all right, now let's think about the FSAM algorithm. So we start with we start with the zero function. So in that case, that's all the coefficients are zero, right? So after m minus one stages, suppose the coefficients of these functions are w1 through wn. Concept check. Suppose we're in stage th three. What's the most number of w's that can be non-zero? Or have I made a mistake? All right, so something like that. So basically, in every stage, at most one of these, it, starting from the beginning, we take, in the first stage, at most one of these w's can change from 0, because we're picking a, a function from the set, and we take a step in that, in some, some multiple of that function. So the coefficient of that function will change from 0, but the others won't. All right. So anyway, after n minus 1 stages, we have our coefficients of the n functions. And then we're going to choose our next step direction. Let's call it now a new function from this f. And the new parameters are going to be, you know, suppose we chose the jth function, then we just increment wj by vm, the step size. That, this, now the subscripts are correct. It's the mth step. And in the mth step, we chose the jth uh, function, and the step size is vm. And this should look a lot like, this looks a lot like coordinate descent, right? One thing that's different is that in coordinate descent, the way we talked about it, we did some kind of, we were not using any s smart method to choose which coordinate we were optimizing. We did cyclic coordinate descent, where we go cyclically through all the coordinates, or randomly chose one was another approach. But here, we're choosing the coordinate that does the best possible, right? Remember, we're doing a minimization over both the function h, which I'm calling now the coordinate, like the coordinate, it's associated with the coordinate, and how much we step in that direction. So the analog would be as though we were doing coordinate descent, but instead of cycling through the coordinates, we kind of looked ahead. We tried every coordinate and found the best step we can take in each coordinate direction. And then we chose the one that gave the biggest decrease in the loss, and that's the direction we went. And then we, again, looked at all the possible coordinate directions and how well we could do by taking a step in the best step in each coordinate direction. We found the coordinate that gave the best performance, and we took that coordinate. Yeah? 
I put them back. <laughs> VMs are absorbed in the, not in general, but in the case I added a new assumption. I said, simplifying assumption, for example, two, F is closed under rescaling. But then I put them back. Okay. All right. Yeah, so can we just do regular cyclic coordinate descent on this? Well, I mean, so first of all, if we have a finite set of hypotheses, this is feasible to think about. But usually our hypothesis space is infinite. So in that sense, no. Yeah. Yeah. OK, great question, great question, great question. Suppose your hypothesis space is closed under, I don't know, it's a vector space. So it's closed under a linear combination. So any linear combination of these hypotheses is, again, in the hypothesis space. And um, so you're, what you're saying is that you could have found the best possible one in the first step. Yeah, I think, I think that's correct. If you, can, if you can actually find the best in the whole space. That's not closed on a linear combinations? Yeah, yeah. Like so, right, so it's often used for like decision trees or something. In any case, though, what we're going to find is that it's not actually that easy to find the best in the hypothesis space. So even though we can write down the argmin, what, I'm, what we're getting at is that it's not always that easy to find the best in the space. And so um, and what's coming next is we're, we're not even going to try to find the best in the space. So we're going to need to take multiple steps to get there. But. Um, it's again. It's if it's not. I, I don't think that the issue is. Um, the issue will be no. on the optimization, finding the actual minimum, not the not on the uh, hypothesis that is. Okay. So basically, let me just summarize what you're saying. If you have a hypothesis space that's closed, that's a vector space that's closed under linear combinations and you know how to find the optimal from that set, then there is no need for this boosting. <laughs> that is correct. Yeah. Good. That's a good point. All right. All right, so I think I have time to at least motivate the next thing, and then we can finish up tomorrow if there's some issues. All right, so the challenge is finding the best h. All right, it's finding the h in the hypothesis space. So we'll call that the step direction. Um, so what if we said, all right, finding the best possible h is too hard? Because it's not just so you have to find the h, and then you can go an arbitrary, arbitrary amount in each direction. 
But what if we just restricted to asking for locally the best step direction? So what does that mean? So I'm right now, now let's pretend we're back in the optimization, iterative optimization world. And now I'm at f sub m minus 1. And I can step in different directions. Each direction corresponds to a, a, new, a new h, exactly. h is like a step direction. It's a function, yes. But you can add functions. You can add multiple functions to each other. So it's reasonable to picture this just like we picture optimizing functions over a parameter space. Now we're optimizing functions over a function space. But let's just say that the floor is still the function space. So a given point on the floor corresponds to a function. So I'm right now at f sub m minus 1. And then there's another function, h. And if I add a little bit of h to f sub m minus 1, maybe I, I go this way in function space. OK. So right, the FSAM has to look in every function direction and find the best possible that we can do, no matter how far we go in each of those directions. This is a lot harder than saying, what if we only take a really small step in each of these directions? What would be the best then? And now this should sound very familiar from lecture one. This is a lot like a gradient type of question. Which direction is the steepest descent direction from where I am right now? So if we're in finite dimensional space and we could take a gradient, that would be the negative gradient. It would be like the steepest direction. So what we're looking for, and, and that is different from the best direction, right? The best direction we could go would be, would have to not just look locally, but look pick a direction and, and look at the entire ray in that direction to see how far it can go. You know, maybe it's interesting things happen as you go further. So for gradient, we're only looking locally, like small step. All right, so let's think about instead of this FSAM where we have to look far away to find the best possible direction, we're only going to require it to be the best in a little area. So it's gradient-like. OK. So Roughly speaking, we're going to choose. Yeah, this question now. We'll see. So, um, so function space. Code. Okay. So HM is kind of H is going to be kind of like a gradient in function space. Um, it's going to be in other terms. It's what we call like a functional gradient because it's gradient with respect to a function, which is strange, it seems. And we also want that h to be in f, right? It's got to be, the h's are always in the hypothesis space f. So it's like, conceptually, it's kind of like taking the gradient and then projecting it onto f to make sure it's still in f, as close as possible to the actual gradient, but in f. So that's kind of the conceptual picture. But it gets actually easier than it sounds. All right, so here's the. The, the original thing, right? The empirical risk, the average loss. And this notion of functional gradient with respect to f, like we kind of want to differentiate with respect to f to find the best f direction. But what does that even mean? Um, so it turns out, though, if you notice, f only enters into this expression in a very limited way, right? A function f is a very complicated object, potentially. It has to assign a number to every single element of its domain x, of its input space. That's what a function does. Right? For any input, it gives a number. That's a function. But the function isn't showing all that complexity in this loss. We are only looking at the function f at endpoints. Right? The input space could be uncountably infinite. Usually is. High dimensions, whatever. But we only actually look at f at least on this training loss, at endpoints. Let's leverage that a bit. So let's define a vector f, which has the evaluations of f at each of the endpoints. Okay. Make it a column vector. So we can rewrite this objective in terms of this finite dimensional vector f. f. What's the dimension of f? It's the number of training points, right? And f sub i could be the prediction on the i-th training point, right? We could take the gradient of this with respect to f, right? That would, that sounds interesting. We could take the gradient of this with respect to f. So we would, we would, if we were to do this, we'd want to go in the negative gradient direction, right? 
So we want to go negative g gradient with respect to the vector f of the objective jf. OK. So if I'm here in function space, I'm at fm minus 1. And I took this gradient with respect to f, but only at the end training points. How do I take a step in function space in that direction? That's kind of weird. There's, there's lots of functions that would have particular values at, you know, negative g is the value you want the function to have at the end training points. Right? So there's lots of functions that would have those uh, values at the end training points. So what we're going to look for is the function that's actually in a hypothesis space that's closest to negative g. That's the idea. So we're going to look at, and what, what do we mean by closest? Well, here's a way. So find the function, find the h, step direction, in the hypothesis space f that's closest to negative g at the training points in this L2 sense. All right. Negative g, so we're summing over the end training points. We want a function h, a step direction, that at each of the points xi is as close to gi as possible in this kind of average square sense. All right. OK. So h now is a function in the function space. So that's something that we can actually consider a step direction. All right. So this is called, this is called you could call this projected gradient descent, projected functional gradient descent. All right. And what kind of problem is this? So we're minimizing over h over this. This should look very familiar, right? We just talked about this exact thing earlier. Yeah, this is a least squares regression problem, not necessarily linear regression. This is the exact same thing that we reduced L2 boosting to. Right? Talked about that before. All right. So, okay. so if we can solve this problem, which we can. We can solve regression problems over various hypothesis spaces. We, we can do trees. We can do, um, and that's the most commonly used in this case, but we can do any, anything that can solve regression over your hypothesis space. We can plug in top to solve this. Yes? So f and h are, I mean, the same thing, right? f and h are elements of the, h is, what do you mean? <laughs> Well, it got me confused. I mean, <laughs> okay. Function f. What what does the function f essentially mean? Uh, is it similar to h? That we get? Okay. Um, f. Our over, our final prediction function f is a sum of a lot of h's. Is that correct? A weighted sum of a lot of h's. Is that correct? Yeah. A non-negative combination of a lot of H's. Yeah, that's right. So this is pretty cool. So no matter what our loss function is, we can reduce this problem to regression over the hypothesis space that we choose. The inner loop, the inner loop does a lot of regression. Even if our loss function is whatever. It could be hinge. It could be, we just have to be able to calculate this gradient or maybe subgradient. All right. So what's left is the step size. right? So we chose an h. Um, what would your intuition be on a good scale for a step size here? Like what do we use for gradient descent, homework one? OK. Something like, yeah? One over t. Oh, that's interesting. One over t. That's if you want to make sure. Yeah, OK. That's a, that's a viable step size. Sure. The scale, um, remember the fixed step sizes? Yeah, OK. So yeah. 0 0.1, 1, something like this. Um, the full gradient would be 1. Take vi equal 1. That would be the full gradient step. That's a, that's a viable algorithm. 
I may not always converge, but okay. All right, so as far as choosing the step size, one approach, which is kind of hypothetical because it's hard to do, is line search. So find the best possible step size in terms of minimizing your loss. Um, that'd be nice. What's often done in practice is just choose a fixed scale factor, so like 0.1. So you, take a, you just choose a step size, 0.1. In this context, sometimes it's called a shrinkage parameter. Um, and this is a form of, you can consider it a form of regularization, where instead of taking the full gradient step, you take a smaller step, it's kind of, and it's, it takes you longer to get to your goal, but sometimes you get to a little bit of a better destination. All right. Um, okay. Let me stop here. I think I'll recap tomorrow with some a little refinement. But do you have any quick questions? Okay. See you guys tomorrow. We'll also give back the exams tomorrow.